Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name's Jess and I'm from Medicine UK, Global Surgery. Um, this is the second part of our research methods webinar um, in collaboration with various IFMSA working groups on global surgery, including IFMSA Grenada, Pakistan, Mexico and Morocco. Um, and we're also working with global surgery. Um, to start us off, we're going to have an introduction with Chetan, which will take 10 minutes. We're then going to move on to critical appraisals with Zara Jeffrey, then how to write an abstract with Ed Fitzgerald, then levels of evidence with Henry Clairoux, and then we'll have 10 minutes of questions at the end. Um, and yeah, we'll see how this goes. So if we start off with Chetan. Um, so hi everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm here on behalf of the Global Search Collaborative, and we've we've put together this research skills course for everyone to kind of get to a, a good idea about research skills. It, we've we've run this across the UK, and it's the first time we do this over the internet. So apologise if if we have small technical hiccups. Um, the way we've designed the course is that we've had one two weeks ago, which if you missed out, you can watch again on YouTube. And then we've got this one coming up now as well. The, the courses are designed to give two parts. The first, the first half of the course is a kind of lecture base, which is a critical appraisal. And the second half, which is delivered by Ed, is a how-to and a practical way of going around how to do something. And today's talking about how to write an abstract. And we'll give you good tips and pointers and when you go to write your own abstracts from your research projects. The Global Search Collaborative itself is an opportunity for you guys to get involved in research after hearing about these courses. We know all too well that people offer skills and they offer opportunities and they give you advice, but no real tangible project that you can get involved with and act those skills as soon as you've gone through that. So the Global Search Project is a way in which you can get involved with research straight up after listening to this course if, you, if that's something that you want to get involved in. So I've just got a short video to play for you, everyone to talk about the Global Search Project and introduce you to what it is. So I'm just going to go ahead and play the video now. Global Search stands for the Global Global Outcomes Collaborative. It's an international network of over 3,000 surgical researchers, from medical students to consultant surgeons. The last study, Global Search 1, collected data from across 67 countries. This included 15,000 patients. We found that surgical site infections are one of the most common post-operative complications following midline laparotomies. The incidence more than doubles between countries of a high human development index and those with a low human development index. Combined with the growing rates of antibiotic resistance, it is important to investigate this further. Global Search 2 is a project launching in January 2016 and aims to determine the incidence of worldwide surgical site infection following gastrointestinal surgery. The secondary aims include finding out the rates of antibiotic resistance, how 13-day follow-up is completed across participating centres, and the impact of pre-hospital delays. This project is your chance to be part of a growing global network and contribute to incredible surgical research. It's also an opportunity to gain authorship on papers that are cited on PubMed. There are a number of roles available. You can take part by forming a team at your healthcare centre to collect data as a collaborator, or evaluating data collected at your centre as an independent validator, or even coordinating and supporting teams across your region as a lead. Start by registering on globalsurge.org where you'll be able to access the study protocol and online training modules. These will guide you through the project. Remember to apply approval at your healthcare centre early as you won't be able to start collecting data without this. Remember that support is always available through regional leads or the steering committee and they'll be able to answer any further questions. Okay, so that was just a really brief video on what Global Surge is about and how it, it works and what we do. Um, I hope that if that's of interest to you, you would like to take part in it. 
and and now I'm going to hand over back to uh, Jessica, who will introduce you to the first speaker, which is Zara. Okay, so our first speaker is going to be Zara Jaffrey, and she is talking on critical appraisal. Okay. So Zara, are you ready to go? Hi, I'll just uh, screen share just a second. Can everyone see the screen? You should do now. It should be available now. Okay, great. So my name is Zara Jeffrey, and I'll be talking you through how to critically appraise a paper. Generally, it's quite an important skill to have because whatever your reason is for using literature, be it to practice evidence-based medicine, um, to inform your clinical decisions, or whether you're starting a new research project and you just want to find out what's out there already, or even if it's just browsing a subject of interest, um, you need to be able to evaluate the paper for its validity and its clinical relevance. So let's work through an example. Say a 33-year-old mother comes in for a repeat prescription of her oral contraception pill. She's been on it for a year and she tells you that she smokes about 20 to 30 cigarettes a day and you remember reading somewhere that smokers on the pill are at high risk of a myocardial infarction or an MI and you want to investigate this further. So the first step would be to form a clear question in your head. What exactly are you trying to answer by searching the literature? And you need to follow a PICO format that would help you. Um, so this involves identifying the population, the intervention, comparison, and outcome. So here, our question would be, are women who smoke and take oral contraceptive at a higher risk of MI than women who smoke that use other forms of contraception? So here we, we know that our population are women on contraceptives. Our intervention is um, oral contraceptives versus the comparison of other types of contraceptives and the outcome we're looking at are MIs. So you can break your question down into keywords that would help you search databases, be that Web of Science, Embase, Medline or, or a combination of these to try and get as much information as you can. And then once you have found papers that, that look relevant to you, you'd want to, to analyze them by answering three questions. Is the study valid? What are the results of this paper? And how are the results relevant to the question I'm trying to answer? So focusing on the first part, you need to look at the study's research question and how well it connects to your own research question and what the design of that research is. So I've got this example here. Um, you can skim through it quickly. I don't know how, how clearly you can see the writing on your own screen, but I can give you a quick uh, summary of it. Um, so this is quite an old article, but I thought it would be quite useful to just go through it and um, critically appraise it ourselves. So the risk of myocardial infarction, angina, and stroke in users of oral contraceptives, an updated analysis of a cohort study. Um, it looks at 70... Is your... At the moment, are you intending to have just um, the opening slide that just is about bias? No, I put it on. I okay. put it on. Do you mind if we. There we go. Now we're on what we're meant to be on. There we go. Okay, hopefully it'll work from now on. Can you, just can you see this? Yeah, now you're moving through it fine. That's absolutely great. Perfect. So that's the. That's the can you see the first slide at the moment? The yeah, we're on global surge critical appraisal. Okay, and um, why it's important. So uh, we've gone through these. Um, and now we should be on, on, a, on a screen showing an abstract. Can you all see that? Um, I think it's maybe taking a little bit of time to catch up with you. It's still on the um, opening screen. Oh, I see. OK. Mm. Now you're on the abstract. There we go. Let's OK. I think it might be working faster if I don't use the the slideshow feature. Okay. So I'll I'll just keep it like this then. Can can everyone see that so far? It's an abstract. Um, I'll let you get back to it now. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So just in summary, this is a cohort study of 17,032 women using contraception who were followed for 20 to 26 years. And one of the outcomes that were measured were the rate of MIs. And it compared women that had used oral contraception and those that hadn't. And a subgroup analysis compared the rate of MI in women that smoke and use oral contraceptives and those who smoke and don't use oral contraceptives. So here we know exactly who's participating. You'd have to look into the paper a bit more to see what the inclusion and exclusion criteria would be. Um, and we know that it's a cohort study design. Now what we'd want to do next is find out um, whether the design is fit for the question that it's trying to answer. Um, and here we have um, a pyramid uh, used to place place evidence um, based on their based on their quality. Um, generally, somebody somebody else is going to be talking about this in a lot more detail than I will. But for each study design, it's associated with its own level of evidence. Um, with systematic reviews are being considered more reliable than expert opinions, which are at the bottom. And cohort studies. Uh, like the one described in the abstract are placed somewhere in the middle. Um, and cohort studies are generally a good a good way of looking at prognosis and the effect of exposure over a long time. Um, so overall this is this is a quite an appropriate study for the for the question we're trying to answer. The next step would be to look at whether there are any other sources of bias. So this next slide is um, just a quick mind map of um, types of bias that you might be that might come up in papers. Can everyone see this? I just want to make sure that the slides are catching up to what I'm saying. At the moment, it's working, I think it's working fine now. Yeah. Okay. Apart from you, just stop screen sharing. Have I? Screen share. Yeah, it's still showing your screen, but your screen is currently blank. Okay. Can you see it now? Going through the. Yeah, good. It's working fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, bias is any. Any factor that would influence your results other than the intervention that you're investigating. So um, there are over 30 different types of bias, but I've put them into broader categories. So selection, performance, data collection, and assessment. Selection bias is looking at the individuals that form your groups and um, whether there are any anything that could influence your results um, that would cause 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 your results to be that would cause your results to to be different um, other than because of the intervention that's in place. So a way to minimize this would be through randomization. Um, performance bias is anything that that could influence the people taking part in the study, be that the actual participants or the people assessing the trial. Um, so the best way to try and minimize that is blinding um, both the assessors and the individuals participating. And then data collection bias looks at methods used to actually measure, measure data or measure the outcomes of your study. And then assessment looks at the way in which the study was analyzed and the data collected was analyzed. And so um, an example here would be if we go back to our abstract, um, if you actually look up the paper you and read through some of the methods, it, it will show you that the um, that the the follow-up there was 10% less patients followed up over the 20 to 30 year period than had origi originally taken part and there was no intention to treat analysis performed afterwards to try and account for the missing data. So that is a form of assessment bias. The next step would be to see what the results are and generally you want to look at the size of the treatment effect, the average difference, um, or this could be in the form of odds or risk ratios. 
and how precise the treatment effect estimate is in terms of its p-values, how much of that estimate um, is due to chance, the standard errors, and how confident your, your treatment effect is to the true value. Um, so here, the study uses risk ratios and confidence intervals to quantify the treatment effect. And overall, they concluded that women were more likely to have uh, MI if they were on the oral contraceptive and were smokers. So overall, you need to now put this into a clinical context and see how are these results relevant to your clinical situation or to the question you're trying to answer. And there are a number of things you need to look at. So here we, uh, in terms of how high this was in, in your pyramid in terms of its quality. Since it was somewhere in the middle, you'd want to see whether there are higher quality pieces of evidence out there. Um, and usually a collection of different types of evidence are used to form systematic reviews or um, form guidelines that would be used to make clinical decisions in real life. And so you need to see how much this piece of research would contribute to something like that. And then you also need to factor in the situation you're in, look at the patient's preference and other other aspects of your patient's care that might influence your decision. Um, so really it's taking a holistic approach to incorporating the evidence into the way you manage your patient. Um, and basically you, the way in which you can start to practice to do this is using checklists on this web, on these resources, so how to read a paper, um, critical appraisal skills program, and the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine have different checklists for going through papers and things to look out for and ways in which to analyze the evidence so that you can be more informed about making decisions. Um, and then once you get used to that, you, it becomes second nature and you will be able to do it without using the checklist to go through. So thank you very much. That's the end of my, my topic. Okay, thank you very much, Zara. And now I think if we just get on to the next. We're having Ed talk next, I believe. Um. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, that's great. Fantastic. Let me just put up my PowerPoint. Is that sharing okay? Not at the moment, is it? Have you shared it? I have. Let's there we go. It catches up. Yeah, there's a delay between the on on the website and though this conversation is working fine, Ed. Fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us for this course. Uh, it's really great to be able to do this online, um, and we're looking forward to getting your questions at the end and getting some of your feedback. Um, my name's Dr. Ed Fitzgerald. I'm uh, one of the founders of Global Surge. I'm a general surgery registrar based in London. Um, I've got an interest in uh, global surgery and research and medical education, and um, this little short lecture uh, over the next 20 minutes is hopefully going to explain to you how to go about writing an abstract. Now uh, this is based really on the hard lessons that I've learned myself from how to take a bit of work that you develop from scratch and summarize it into a concise uh, uh, um, abstract summary that could perhaps be submitted to a conference will form the start of a paper um, uh, um, adequately summarize what the work is that you've undertaken. So in the next 20 minutes, um, I'm going to run through a few points with you. And I hope that by the end of this, you'll be able to understand why a study abstract is an important part of scientific communication, understand the process by which abstracts are selected for presentation at scientific conferences, uh, and learn the basic features which make an abstract uh, successful when you're submitting that to a conference. Now, I break this down into seven parts, which I think we need to consider. Firstly, explaining what an abstract is. Secondly, thinking about why you'd need to write one. Thirdly, what is it that makes it stand out? And that's particularly relevant if you're submitting an abstract for a, for a journal or perhaps as a summary of your thesis or if you're submitting it for a conference presentation. Thinking a little bit, if you are submitting it, where to submit to. Uh, and I will give you a bit of background information about how abstracts are marked based on um, marking that I get involved with both, both journal reviewing and also conference submissions. Um, I think talk to you a little bit about why abstracts get rejected on that basis and what some of the most common problems are that I come across when I'm reviewing abstracts for other people. So starting at the beginning, what is an abstract? 
Well, this is a, a simple example from a paper that I uh, published some years ago when I was really just starting out um, in the academic world. Um, an abstract is a really concise, brief summary of all of the pertinent and salient points relating to a bit of work that you've undertaken. And the format of it can differ depending on the study and depending on the journal or the conference. But the basic tenets you can see here, hopefully, on the screen in front of you. Obviously, you have the title to the article that you're undertaking and the authors that have uh, participated in developing it. But the abstract will most typically break down into four parts. The background, which is usually just three or four sentences explaining what the relevant context of undertaking this study is, what, what perhaps the problems currently are, and what you've set out to do to address that or to add further information. The methods uh, explains very simply in two or three sentences how you went about delivering what you're reporting, be that a literature review or be that an original research study that you've undertaken. The results flag up the key most important findings that are the most relevant summary for the reader, the key learning points that you want them to take home that explain the core of what you are uh, demonstrating or showing. And the conclusion is the discussion, the summary, uh, looking at why that is then uh, important, what's relevant, what the impact might be, what others might need to do to clarify or take that bit of work further. Now, secondly, why write one? Um, for most people, when they're faced with a thesis or a full academic research paper, I think a lot of people won't either have the, the time or perhaps the inclination or interest to read through the full many thousand words in some cases to understand the totality of the work that's been undertaken. So the abstract is a way of providing a brief summary of the key points um, that someone can scan through and decide whether it's of interest or relevance to them or not. And if it is, then perhaps they can go on and read the full paper or the full thesis, or maybe they can just extract the key results they need to there in the abstract for them. So it offers that brief synopsis, and that includes the, the mythology, the pertinent results, the salient findings. And as we mentioned already, that could be for a thesis, a paper, an audit, or most commonly a conference presentation, which is an opportunity to present your work to others, also an opportunity to go to a conference and network with other people and get your name known. And often all of these can be useful for listing on your CV. So thinking about the actual abstract writing process, we can break it down into a number of parts, setting out why the topic is important and what you did to address that, what you found and what that adds and why that's relevant, why that's important. Now, perhaps the most important point in this is planning it out and planning ahead. So in terms of uh, submitting an abstract for a conference to go and present, you need to really sort out well in advance what you're going to be doing, not just the bit of work, but actually target the conference that you're going to be submitting to. And in that case, you then need to do a project that's aimed at that submission date find out what sort of work the conference normally presents, get colleagues to help you and buddy up with other people, and make sure that you've had some practice at writing abstracts beforehand. And I'll, I'll give you some tips as to how you can go about doing that in a minute. Now, I review a uh, conference for the Association of Surgeons in Training um, every year. Uh, uh, their conference abstracts, uh, they uh, will typically see about half of them submitted on the final weekend before the deadline. And the problem is when you, when you push things late for abstract submission to a conference, then the risk of not quite getting it right and hitting the nail on the head, uh, you can often miss an opportunity because it's rushed at the end. And that can be related to language, to the content, to outcomes. And also just having a, a grasp of what a scientific writing style is when you're summarizing this bit of work in, in what might only be perhaps 200, 300, 400 words. Many conferences for an abstract submission will set a, a specific word count that you can't exceed. So we talked about these key points um, a moment ago, and this is very much the same whether you're submitting to a conference or whether you're writing an abstract for a paper to a company, a paper that you're submitting to a journal or, we, or for your thesis. You need to take time and make sure that the title of your um, the work comes across in the right way. And that might be a title that sells the main result of the finding, or it might be a title that asks the research question that you were asking. And sometimes you can even try and, and make a pun or a topical comment around the work that you're undertaking, although by and large the scientific writing style tends to shy away from making a joke out of serious academic work. But I've seen that done a few times. 
The background um, can also be called um, the introduction or the aims, depending on the journal or the conference that you're submitting to. And as I mentioned, it's typically no more than three sentences to set out what you're doing, why it's relevant, why that's of interest. And typically the final sentence of the background or the introduction of the aims will say exactly what it was that you were going to do in this study. So you might say um, something, for example, um, dealing with looking at surgery, looking at global surgeries we do, that the um, global burden of surgical disease is yet to be clarified. Uh, your second sentence may say um, what uh, the impact this has in terms of resources that are made available. And your third sentence might say, uh, in this study, we set out to examine um, the differences in surgical outcomes around the world. So very simple and straightforward. The methods uh, explains how you conducted the study, and it should include anything that you didn't know when you started. So this is often a point of confusion as to what's a result and what's a method. So for example, if you were to run a survey and uh, 100 people responded, then often that sort of thing is creeps into the methods. People will write 100 people responded to the survey. But that's actually a result because the method was writing the survey, putting it online, distributing it. But how many people replied and what they said, that's a result that is one of the findings that you need to report in the next section. And as I mentioned already, that's a concise um, report of just the most important findings, including the basic statistical analysis, if appropriate, if you've conducted that as part of your study. And that might just be quoting the, the p-value, the relevant p-values. And the conclusion, the discussion, um, that's interpretation. So again, sometimes results creep into the conclusion or discussion section of an abstract. And really, um, the, this section is higher level than that. What you're looking to uh, really summarize for the reader is what was the key finding and the interpretation of that? What does it mean for them? What does it mean for patients or for, um, for, for the clinical condition you're talking about, whatever the topic of your study is? Now, I get a lot of questions asked around some of these points uh, when it comes to writing abstracts. Uh, one of the typical ones will be who to include as an author and what um, uh, what order to list the names of people involved. And so an, an, an important point just to be aware of when it comes to academic writing for, for a journal paper or for an abstract is that um, the list is usually in order of contribution. Um, so the first author that's listed will be the person who is, who's done the, the majority of the work around a project. Um, but the very last author on the authorship list is typically the overseeing senior author who takes a responsibility for the study, for the conduct, perhaps for the idea, for the oversight. Um, and the authors in between have had involvement usually in decreasing order. Now that's when uh, that particular uh, example is when authors are published um, for our collaborative work with Global Surge. We take a very different approach, and we actually present um, uh, under a group name. So we list everybody who has collaborated and contributed with our work, but um, and that is those authors are all citable. But we will just publish uh, under the uh, author name of Global Surge. Um, and then when you uh, ha get the paper or when you look on PubMed, everybody is there listed. Um, but it makes for a much more meritocratic way of publishing because we've worked together as a collaborating team to get this up and running. Now, um, then thinking about work that you've already presented, another question that I'm commonly asked is when you can present work that's already been presented um, if you're submitting an abstract to a conference. And typically, you can present once locally, perhaps at a hospital meeting or a local trainee meeting. You can present once nationally. Um, and you can pre present the same piece of work once internationally. The important thing is to just let each of those organizations that you might be presenting at know that it has already been presented before somewhere else because some conferences and organizations um, are not keen on that and they might call it duplication of academic work. And so if it's already been published, let them know. And obviously, if you have any declarations of interest or conflict, previous presentations, funding, please do declare that. So how do I do it? Thinking about conferences specifically, um, I identify conferences and deadlines well in advance. Um, I select a topic that's appropriate to the conference. Um, I will make sure that I'm aiming it at the right level. And um, I will uh, always make sure that I'm aware of what the competition is likely to be. What else are people going to submit, for example? Um, 
make sure you look at conferences to see what they've previously published and when you go have a look at other people's presentations and see what uh, they're putting in and always get someone else to cast an eye over an abstract before you're submitting it and that's the same whether it's for a conference or whether it's being submitted with a journal paper or with a thesis. Um, finding out where to submit often these days um, you will find out of local or national conferences through the relevant associations um, do go online look at Google um, explore what conferences are available there are some websites for example uh, surgical conference finder listed here um, that where people will put listings of conferences around the world so you can find out where you might be able to submit to just keep your eyes open ask around, find out from seniors and bosses where they go to present. And the lifeblood of conferences is having abstracts submitted and presented. They need people to attend and so most conferences are very keen to get people engaged and get them submitting their work. And it's very easy to find out what other people are doing. Uh, PubMed is a resource full of millions of abstracts from published academic work around the globe. And so if you have a particular area or topic of interest, um, make sure you go and search this in PubMed and find out how other people have, um, what the sort of recipe is that they've used for presenting their findings in a summarized fashion. Um, here's an example um, of a, a, a cross-sectional study that I undertook. Um, this was a slightly different format of abstract, which is why I put it up. This was a narrative abstract, and the, this was for a journal, and they didn't want it broken down by different sections, although they still wanted those sections reflected in the flow of the abstract. And what I've done out here is pick out in red some of the key points um, that were the ones that really came, wanted to be pulled out of this because this for me is what some of the key findings were and I think if you read out these points highlighted in red you would get the gist of this whole study just through those um, and, I, and that's only 207 words for the whole thing if uh, the abstract had been shorter and I just used these red words I think that would be what I um, would pull out as being the core of this body of work and that's what you really need to hone in on when you yourselves are writing abstracts to try and summarize what's been done. Um, and this is another example, uh, this is from a case report and I put this up because um, abstracts for case reports are slightly different because often there isn't a method as such to report and it's not so much a result as it is a, a clinical case that you're presenting but you still use a structure to break it down um, and this is an example of an abstract that was uh, submitted and presented at a conference a few years ago uh, a particularly uh, uh, interesting and rare presentation but you can see here how they still introduced it and set the context and they set out that we report a case they then give the details of the case and they then very correctly discuss why this was relevant, why it was important, why this was a notable case to report and they finish by saying this case demonstrates, which is a really great way of summarizing the learning from this. It's a very good example of a, an abstract based around a case report. Um, so what to include? Um, this should be common sense because you're just reporting what you did, but there are some important points to be aware of um, that you should include very important you state clearly what the study design was what was your aim or hypothesis what, that you were testing what did you set out to do and how did you do that was it a, an observational study an experimental study were you looking prospectively as cases happened and collected them or were you retrospectively looking back in past and reviewing cases from uh, from a, a time um, um, previously and if you're conducting a review and you're selecting papers to include how did you select them what was your search strategy and um, what was the time period why did you include or exclude studies um, and what were the number of cases versus papers versus patients and there is an old rule around abstracts of trying to squeeze in a p-value and I, I think any statistician, statisticians listening to this would be horrified and I think the point is not to try and make stats for the sake of it but if you are undertaking a statistical analysis make sure you include that in your abstract because it conveys that you have taken an extra layer of analysis that you properly thought about how to um, uh, do that and so even if it's not a significant finding demonstrating that you've done that and that you know that it's a non-significant finding is important. Um, Thinking about marking abstracts, my experience, um, marking abstracts is a painful process. We often have many to look through and not a lot of time to do so. Um, but these will be the key points that we look for and this is how you should aim to write your abstracts. It's very important that you have very great clarity about what you're doing in the title and the aims and the methods. Really make sure you hone down to the key points. The work should be original, there is no point in duplicating, but if it is similar to work that's been undertaken or you are repeating previous work, it's very important to be clear what you're adding and why. 
appropriate methodology, appropriate results, appropriate conclusions we've discussed. The scientific merit is perhaps a measure of the, the complexity of your study and how much it adds to our body of understanding. And the importance of the message, well, is this something that is a topical important clinical problem or perhaps something very niche and, and something that will not change practice and that all of that builds to an overall impression of the, the work that's gone into this and the effort that's gone into the piece of work that you're summarizing and important that this if you're going to a conference that this is relevant and of interest to the other delegates and that it's adhered to any submission guidelines um, a few quotes that I think are very important in summarising the general approach to this is that it's important to get an interesting question and to answer it well. Um, and it's important to get other people's input to help you do that, particularly when you're first starting out. Um, but I like Arthur Shallow's um, quote about the fact that to do successful research, you don't need to do everything. You don't need to know everything, but you just need to know of one thing that isn't known already. So what's the one thing that you can pick out that's an interesting clinical finding that perhaps isn't previously reported? And the other quotes here you can read, I like particularly the point about the fact that basic research is like shooting an arrow in the air and where it lands, paint a target, because often that does feel like what you're doing with a lot of clinical research. You're not always sure where it's going to land, but you still need to make a story out of it when it gets there. In my experience of why abstracts get rejected, um, simply for big conferences, it's not that there's anything fundamentally wrong with the abstract, it's just that it didn't score high enough compared to others that have been submitted. And you have to remember that for conferences, abstract submission is a competitive process. There may be thousands of abstracts submitted and perhaps some conferences will only take a small percentage of that. So really, it's not just getting an abstract that's good enough, it's getting an abstract that's good enough in comparison to others. Perhaps the fundamental failing point is submitting an abstract for a conference where the content isn't relevant at all, but also failing to follow the submission guidelines, failing to format it correctly, and then all of the points that we mentioned earlier, not getting those right, not having clear aims, not describing a methodology, inadequate data collection to answer the question that you're asking, these are all points that can lead to an abstract being rejected from a conference. And I think uh, perhaps a more bird's eye view of the work that's involved. If you're just starting out, then it's important to think of the evidence ladder around um, clinical trials, experimental design, case control, case series. Writing a case report is, is very easy and it's very much at the bottom of this pyramid. Um, but a case of one, unless it's something really remarkable these days, is unlikely to necessarily be accepted. A systematic analysis, uh, um, very important complex often review of the body of work on a particular topic but also very time consuming and, and perhaps more difficult to put together similar with a randomized control trial so thinking realistically about where you pitch your work on this ladder is important. Um, I think some general points that I would take away mentioned that case reports are already perhaps problematic because of the um, lack of uh, extrapolation or validity across patient populations. But if you're undertaking perhaps a simple audit, make sure that it is novel or interesting. I will typically see the five topics here, many abstracts in each one submitted into conferences. And eventually, it's difficult to add something new. You eventually get a little bit tired of seeing these. And so it's important that you are bringing some novelty to what you're undertaking. A simple presentation of results without any decent analysis or interpretation of those gets rejected. An inappropriately small case series where it just looks like people haven't managed to collect enough cases or put enough effort in to do so um, is problematic. And for the surgical conferences, often people stretch things to make something a surgical topic when it isn't really. The personal anointers are not adhering to submission guidelines including abbreviations I don't understand, particularly when people are struggling to fit in a word count. If people are too waffly or wordy or vague or unclear or spelling and grammar mistakes, these are the sorts of uh, personal pet hates that I see quite often. Abstracts will get rejected if you're submitting them to conferences. I think when you're starting out, it's important to not give up on that basis. It's not personal. There's probably a good reason that you need to sit down and just find someone who's got a bit more experience to go through it and dissect it, tell you where you went wrong, and try and buff it up so that you can submit it again and hopefully get it accepted when it's been improved. So in summary, Abstract writing is a lot more than just the abstract. If you're submitting it with a journal or, a, or your th thesis or to a conference, plan ahead. Find the right place to submit it to. If it's a conference, make sure you work the deadline. Try and get a good question that you're setting out to answer and answer it well. Get colleagues and particularly senior help. 
get used to writing in a concise scientific way, follow the submission rules, and try not to leave it until the last minute. Finally, if you're submitting to a conference, they do need abstracts to be accepted in order for people to attend. So the, generally, the luck can be on your side. Um, abstract writing is a competitive contact sport, and what I mean by that is the more you have a go at it, the better you'll get, and so keep trying. You have to submit an abstract in the first place to win it, be that for a published paper or be it for a conference, so you've got to get involved. And if you've done a good bit of work, make sure you sell it. Make sure you are concise and scientific writing style and interpret it correctly so that you convey your work in the best light that's possible. So I hope that's a useful summary and uh, I look forward to taking some questions at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you Ed, that was brilliant. Now our last speaker has had to cancel unfortunately, so we're not going to be able to have them um, give their talk, but we'll share their slides with you later so that you can still get hold of that. Um, in the meantime, if we can uh, now move on to sharing questions. So if anyone has any questions, they can type them in the comments in the webinar, and then I will open the floor to whoever it is that would be best to respond to any questions you might have. Okay, so at the moment we don't seem to have any questions, but if anyone does have them, can they type them now? Well, we'll wait a couple of minutes just in case anything comes up, but if not, we'll close the call. Do any of the speakers have anything final they might want to add? Hi, right, it's Ed again here. Um, I think it's fantastic that uh, that so many people are interested in getting involved in uh, academic work and collaborative such as this. I, I think um, it, please do have a look at the Global Surge website. We very much welcome people around the world getting involved. Um, it's a very simple study to get involved in. Uh, we have already noted down all the data we need connecting, uh, collecting and it's just a simple two-week study so it doesn't take up much time uh, to collect the data on the patients and you will be recognized as one of the collaborating co-authors at the end of it. Uh, and if it's the first time that you're getting involved in this sort of research work, it's a great way to get started because you, uh, when you're writing or putting together academic work yourself, there's only so much you can do as an individual but when you're feeding into a project that has a thousand other contributors around in countries around the world in over 70 countries participating then you contribute to something which is much bigger and uh, the the results of that will be will be fed back internationally um, and so it's a really good way of being able to feed into a much larger worthwhile international project uh, and we hope as many people as possible will get involved okay brilliant It looks like we haven't got any questions from our viewers today, so I think we're probably best just to close this. Oh, I have one, one question actually has come in uh, from someone who's watching on YouTube. and They say, at a conference, how do we present the abstract? Just reading it or adding information um, that can they ask? So typically if an abstract's accepted, um, they will ask you to present it either as a poster or as an oral presentation. Um, and if it's a poster, then uh, that is, uh, that's almost a separate presentation in itself as to how to go about doing that. Um, but typically you will expand um, in the same categories, the, the background, the introduction, the methods, the results, the conclusions, but you will expand it into a poster that's put up for display at the conference. Um, if it's a presentation, then it will be s similar breakdown of the format, um, but typically you'll get more time to actually stand and give a podium presentation about the work that you've undertaken using PowerPoint slides. 
Um, and different conferences will have different ways of doing that. And, and these days, some conferences um, will put abstracts online for presentation. Um, so it's worth looking into the conference to find out how they want abstracts to be presented when they're accepted. Um, typically, uh, for most conferences, uh, the what they consider to be the very best abstracts will be invited to give an oral presentation, uh, and then others will be uh, presented as a poster. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, the speaker that couldn't make the call today, I will get hold of their slides, and they will be shared with everyone so they can see them anyway. I'll also possibly try and get hold of Zara's slides if possible, because there was a little bit of a problem with them. And so some people mentioned that they were a bit small and they couldn't see them. But otherwise, thank you very much to our speakers and thank you to our listeners. And that'll be it, I think. Thank you very much, everyone.